so I don't um, know what I'm going to talk about yet. So I might need some help from you. And, uh, I guess everybody here has some interest in Dharma practice. Um, I'm from Australia and I spent 11 years in Thailand, six months in India. I've been in England for five months and um, I, I suppose I'm probably what you'd call a faith type. I have a lot of faith in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. I'm quite comfortable with devotional practices. I really like being a monk. I love retreats. I very much enjoy pilgrimage and uh, the details of monastic life. So sometimes when it comes time to give reflections to lay people, I do recognize that my life is very different. And um, 14 years of living in monasteries now. And um, so I'm not completely sure what I can offer that's helpful. So um, I'm going to ask you any ideas, anything, what, what would you be interested to hear, uh, what might be helpful in your life in this uh, path of cultivating generosity and uh, maintaining ethical precepts, developing the mind. Is there anything that you are interested to hear about? Just uh, throw it out there. If you look in the suttas, it's often the case that somebody asks the Buddha a question and then he, then he will teach them. Because I'm not sure, see, I'm not sure what the texture of your life involves. I'm not sure what your challenges are. I'm not sure how you rise to these challenges. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not sure what to offer in, uh, by way of encouragement. Is that it? Yep. Gaya Vipassana. And Chitta. Chitta Nupassana. Gaya Nupassana is, uh, so we're talking about the four foundations of mindfulness, developing insight into the nature of the body. So my teacher in Thailand says the best way to do this is uh, actually to cultivate the organs and the parts of the body. That's what, that's what he teaches anyway as a foundation for developing insight into the nature of the body, starting with hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin, getting familiar with that and uh, actually investigating those parts to develop an insight into what a body actually is, not what we, not what we project onto it or um, fantasize it to be. But of course also breath meditation is also part of Gayanusati and uh, feelings in the body is also, sorry that's Vedananusati, but breath meditation, walking meditation, and uh, I've also been taught that the best foundation for developing uh, citta nupasana is to focus primarily on developing mindfulness of the body because uh, my teacher in Thailand explained that trying to see w when talking about vipassana we're trying to see the three characteristics of uh, phenomena true characteristics which is anicca dukkha and anatta, impermanence, unsatisfactory and not self. So any insight will be into those three qualities, one of those three qualities. Uh, to try to see the impermanence, not self nature of uh, mind states is difficult because they're kind of deluding, as many of us have a lot of experience. If we focus on developing a lot of body-based mindfulness, my teacher teaches that at a certain point that mindfulness which is generated in the body will simply see mind states according to those uh, characteristics. So you develop the awareness of the breathing, the awareness of what you're doing with the body and also contemplating uh, impermanence of feelings in the body, that, that kind of thing. That will give you the foundation to be able to see mind states as mind states. and. Uh, Dhammas that arise in the mind as dhammas that arise in the mind and see them uh, 
arise and cease. So, how do you practice? How do you try to practice Gaya Nupasana? I think it is the foundation, um, at least how I understand it. But if you can, obviously if you can notice the sensation on the not-self of mind states, that's good. I mean, you may have, you, it may just be your character that you can do that, but even so, generating good, clear body-based mindfulness is going to help that. But in terms of investigation, I think the trick is, or the key is to notice, is your mind becoming peaceful when you do that. So if when cultivating mind, mind states and noticing they're not self or impermanence, if your mind is becoming peaceful, well then I would say it's correct practice and you can continue with it. But if it's just, okay, another mind state and then another mind state and you have to keep noticing and the mind isn't slowing and isn't stilling and that sense of clarity and space isn't becoming more enhanced, then it may not be so strong, that practice. Only you can know that. But even just uh, mindfulness of breathing is... Um, developing that body awareness. So, um, just do make try to. I try to make that the foundation anyway. That's what I do. And just really try to just be aware of the feelings of the breath, and then you can contemplate mind states after doing that for a period of time. That's how it seems to work for me. And, uh, walking meditation is also a very good thing to do, and kind of an underestimated practice. It uh, does develop a very good body-based awareness which is a little more resilient than the peacefulness that comes from sitting. So it seems a little uh, tedious and boring and unsophisticated at first glance and uh, I suppose doing it at home might, might also seem a bit um, abstract. But the fact is, I mean, my experience, experience of many people is that that kind of clarity that you get after a half an hour of walking, the kind of mindfulness you can bring to other phenomena with your eyes open in the world, is more resilient than the, than the kind of peacefulness that you get in the sitting. And a lot of people have that experience of having a fairly peaceful sit and getting up and moving around and answering a few emails or something and it's kind of gone. So I think walking meditation is a very good foundation. Certainly the monks and nuns in Thailand and Burma alternate those practices, understanding that they um, support each other. Do a lot of walking meditation, generate good, sharp, body-based mindfulness so that when you sit, you'll notice these uh, arising and ceasing of feelings and mind states with more clarity, more strength to the mindfulness. So that might help, just really feeling the feelings at the bottom of the feet, making an effort to do that. and. Uh, sharpen the mindfulness, generate the mindfulness before sitting. Very helpful. And, uh, do you have a space where you can do walking at home? or uh, limited. limited, yeah. Yeah, yeah and kind of slow, going slow is okay as well. And when you go slow, you can note the lifting, the moving and the placing, lifting, moving, placing, really slow things down. It's a good thing to do. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Can I ask, um, mm. who your is a disciple of Ajahn Chah. He's in Southeast Thailand, in Rayong. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I also ask um, mm. what you think the role of Samadhi 
samadhis and developing wisdom, and whether it's necessary to develop absorption samadhi right. to develop the higher insights. So I'd rather not talk about my opinions, I'll talk about what my teacher has said. Um, I'll talk about what Ajahn Chah said, uh, as far as I understand. You need some samadhi and some collectedness. That, that gives the mind some integrity. The samadhi supports the sati. But Ajahn Chah also teaches that it's a consistency of mindfulness with clear comprehension that gives rise to samadhi. So it's a consistency of mindfulness with clear comprehension. The clear comprehension part is the part that sees with wisdom. So Ajahn Anand is always talking about sati and panya, consistency of that, mindfulness and wisdom, so that's like the thing that sees a thought as a thought. It's not kind of making a self out of everything. This is tricky, but that's actually what clear comprehension means. It means seeing a thought as a thought, not once we really are the personality, and you know my feeling and what they think and what I think that's not really clear comprehension anymore when it's when you really can see the feeling as the feeling the thought as the thought come back to the breath or come back to the borikama they teach in Thai butto butto whatever it is that you're trying to maintain as a as a mind as a gamatana you're doing that consistently is what gives rise to samadhi and the samadhi is what will enable the insight to have power behind it so you'll cut through delusion, but not necessary to the point of jhana. It's basically understood that if you can have, if you can cultivate absorption, it's good, because the power of the mind after that point will develop insight much more quickly. But um, my teachers have taught that you know kanika samadhi and upajara samadhi is enough, but you have to be more energetic. You have to be very consistent. Uh, Ajahn Anand teaches that if you're kind of developing a certain amount of energy and you're doing it and then you kind of relax a bit and then you do it again and it's not going to work yet. But it is encouraging to know that you can develop very profound insight without jhana. So certainly Ajahn Anand has said that. He uses these kind of uh, hand movements which I find quite helpful. They, they're talking about you've got Upajara Samadhi which is almost jhana where the five hindrances are very, very subtle. And so he said... He's talking about a Sotapati Maga, entering, getting the path to Sotapanna. He says it's like this, it's like, you've got to, you've got to be there, then, and then it's like, so he uses that kind of, if, if that speaks to you, that sense of making the mind as peaceful as you can, as peaceful as you can, as peaceful as you can, investigating, 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 in, uh, kind of a liberating, a profound insight. So, But it is encouraging to know that. So, and... Uh, I know Ajahn Samedha doesn't talk about samadhi very much, but I also know he has it. <laughs> so he, it's the consistency of whatever meditation object you're using. If you can use it consistently, samadhi will be there. So I think Ajahn Samedha doesn't like to talk about it so much because if we get willful about it and it's coming from the self and you want samadhi, that's actually an obstruction. So it's very difficult to get when you come from that space. So he's always talking about wisdom, 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 because that's what most Westerners can understand. But um, you know, he knows what his meditation objects are, and he's very consistent about using them. And he does have samadhi. So I know that from personal conversations with him. So <laughs> yeah. So I think we all need to learn which meditation methods uh, work for us, which ones make the mind significantly peaceful. So that's another thing Ajahn Anand talks about, is knowing what's right for your character, but only you can know that, and it's not that difficult to know. Basically, it's the meditation object that you like, mm -hmm. the meditation object that gives rise to some feelings of rapture. That's the one that's appropriate for your character. And uh, whatever it is that can give you that peacefulness, do that one a lot. And then that will be the foundation for your contemplations, your investigations. So, so. Myself, I like metta, bhavana a lot. And uh, anti anusati is recollecting the Buddha, and even devanusati, things like that, is pr I find very uplifting. And then uh, you can brighten the mind and then contemplate impermanence, not self, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's easier. <laughs> okay.
just thought I'd ask as an interesting question. How many people believe in Nibbana? I'm realizing about English people, you can't just take it for granted that they'll actually ask you a question. <laughs> you have to ask them questions. <laughs> um, it's very, I lived in California for a little bit of time and also in Australia. You ask anyone got any, got any questions and half the room puts their hands up. But in England there's this awkward pause and somebody at the back of the room slowly, <laughs> slowly raises their hand. But anyway, it's quite nice. Somebody explained to me that the English are modest and that that's a, that's a beautiful quality. So <laughs> it's nice to be modest. But I'm interested to know how many people believe in Nibbana? Who thinks Nibbana is, exists? I want to see your hands raised in the air. You don't have to. I'm just interested to know who does. Okay. How many people aren't sure? Not, not sure if Nibbana exists. So most people over this side. Do you believe in Nibbana? You think it exists, yeah? <laughs> and you? Not sure. Well, what is Nibbana? I'm asking you a question. What do you think Nibbana is? Any ideas? Beyond the conditioned, yeah. Ajahn Chah had a nice thing to say about Nibbana. Ajahn Chah said, Nibbana is the reality of the cessation of greed, hatred and delusion. It's a very nice. And I think that he was speaking from that reality, which is very nice. So we have a tendency, some of us, it's, it's good to, Ajahn Pasana Ajahn Amro just re wrote this book called The Island. We don't have many copies yet, but it's uh, excerpts from um, the suttas where the Buddha actually talks about Nibbana. Most people have uh, a lot of people have a belief that the Buddha didn't talk about Nibbana very much, that he talked about the path to it. He did talk about that more, but actually if you put all the times that he did mention Nibbana together in a book, the book is this fat. So um, Ajahn Pasana and Ajahn Amro found many very nice uh, quotes about it. And um, so the Buddha did talk about it as being, you know, something that exists or something that is to be realized. So it's not nihilism, I think a lot, and it's not eternalism. So this is tricky to understand. If it's not nihilism and it's not eternalism, what is it? And uh, but many of us think, um, yeah, if I can go beyond self-view and develop insight, then I'll I won't suffer anymore. And uh, but there isn't much joy necessarily in that. It's one of the reasons I wanted to mention this. Um, and I think it's very helpful in practice to be optimistic and joyful about the goal. It's, uh, it's like something to look forward to, not, not from a position of craving, but from a position of uh, optimism or confidence, faith. So that all the practice that we do, it actually has a goal there is a reason for it, it'll have an outcome and that outcome is going to be very pleasant. So in talking about Buddha, uh, Nibbana, the Buddha said that it was the supreme bliss. So that's not a statement about something nihilistic, is it? The supreme bliss, unshakable peace was something he said about Nibbana. So those are very nice uh, contemplations. Ajahn Chah, coming back to Ajahn Chah, the reality of the cessation of greed, hatred and delusion. So it's just nice to consider that we develop some concentration, we develop some insight, we uh, weaken our delusion, we insight gets deeper, slowly chipping away at greed, weakening greed, weakening hatred by keeping precepts, being generous, cultivating the mind. It's just, it is nice to recollect that the result of that is going to be unshakable peace. The result of that is going to be um, the highest bliss, supreme bliss. That's a nice thing to to uh, bring to mind. I think uh, having spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia and noticing the quality of faith that Southeast Asians have, they're very optimistic and very enthusiastic and very joyful about their religion. And uh, Westerners, we can tend to be, oh, I've got to do something about greed, hatred and delusion. And it's a bit grim sometimes. <laughs> So it's nice to 
at times, think about the result, why we do all this practice. Another thing that it's nice is about is there's other occasions in the suttas where the Buddha talks about where Nibbāna is to be realized. And he said that it's to be realized within this fathom long body. So somewhere between the top of your head and your toes, Nibbāna is to be realized. Now this is very interesting contemplation. Uh, I find it interesting anyway. In as much as what that is inferring or alluding to is that right now in your body and mind there's the potential for unshakable peace and supreme bliss. So that's an interesting thing just to bring to mind. So why don't we experience that? Why aren't I experiencing supreme bliss? Or why aren't I experiencing unshakable peace? We are, as we understand, affected by greed, aversion and delusion upon a foundation of ignorance. But it's, it's just nice to recollect one's potential. And I think it's okay to be very confident about this. In fact, I think it's very helpful to, to really digest the fact that you have the potential to realize unshakable peace and supreme bliss. Ordinary you. Because I think a lot of the time where you know, we believe our diminished and deluded experience so completely that we're not very confident about our abilities and that lack of confidence affects our capacity to put forth effort. So it's like, well just remember as a human being with a body and a mind there is great hatred and ignorance, but those things can be weakened and then eradicated, uprooted, and the result is the reality of the cessation of great hatred and delusion. So that's something to feel happy about, enthusiastic about. That's, that recollection can give us some energy. I so, oh, that's interesting. I think being interested in one's potential is very helpful. It can generate a lot of energy. I so, oh, I should meditate. You know, it's, it's a different attitude to the, oh, yeah, I've got to meditate. Um, respiring for a little bit of peacefulness, weakening of the hindrances a little bit, some respite from confusion, uh, just managing uh, reactivity, you know, all of that's fine, you know, o often. But it's good to also remember what we're really trying to do here and what the real potential that we all have is. And uh, we come to our cushion or our walking path and um, can be enthousi enthusiastic and optimistic. It's like this greed, hatred and, de and delusion thing is like a veil which isn't the truth. And then there's a potential right there where that greed, hatred and delusion is. There's another potential right there. And... Uh, and then if you have the good fortune to meet somebody like Ajahn Chah, you might meet a human being who's done it. And uh, they do still exist in the world, these beings. And there's people who've cultivated this insight to some degree. And you can see that they have a quality of radiance and well-being and spaciousness, non-grasping. And then there's people who've cultivated to a greater degree. So it's still happening. The path, the teachings of the Buddha are here. The path to cultivating insight is here. And uh, the way to liberation is, is still in the world. People are practicing it, people are getting the results, and we all have that potential. So i um, just like to encourage you all to uh, feel optimistic, enthusiastic, and uh, um, about your potential. And, uh, I believe in Nibbana. The, the Buddha said, I believe that this is our potential. And the Buddha said, it's the foundation upon which truth rests, this, uh, this potential of human beings. That's a beautiful thought. The very foundation upon which truth rests is this reality, which is beyond greed, hatred and delusion, which is uh, beyond words, but apparently very blissful experience. So um, it's uh, good to remember that that's why we do a lot of the practices that we do.
that that will be the outcome as long as we stay focused and uh, we do do the practice that's where it's going so, so any questions any more questions yep mm -hmm. I Big selves. Yeah. We have a big self. We have a <laughs> right. Okay. So this is a very juicy question. Thank you. <laughs> a juicy question, I think. <laughs> Tricky. Um, yeah, it is danger. Arjun Chah said Ditti and Mana was the biggest obstruction for Western Westerners. So that is the conceit of views. Now, the thing which has a conceited view, of course, is the self. So that feeling of, I know and I'm right, which all of us struggle with, at least all of the Westerners that I know. <laughs> um, this is a challenge. This can also go in the opposite, opposite direction, funny enough, that I hate myself, I want to kill myself, is actually very conceited. And this is a, a, an interesting thing to contemplate. Um, can, what conceit means is there's a lot of self-perception there. So actually, if, if somebody hates themselves, actually you need to bring a lot of compassion to that and heal heal, and, and stop aiming aversion at the self. That's not helpful. So that needs to give, be given some skillful attention. But this whole this area of conceit is interesting. If, one, if through one's practice one begins to feel conceited, then it's appropriate to compare oneself to beings whose development is more superior than one's own. But this is tricky, because if, if, <laughs> if you're feeling depressed and you do that, that's, you know, that's a nightmare. It's like, if I'm going to compare myself to my teacher in Thailand on a bad day, um, you know, I'd, I'd give up. So it's like, but if I start to think, I'm very special. I'm an Ajahn. I've been a monk for 10 years now. That's very special. Very few human beings can do what I've done. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I start to think that and if I really believe it, then I have to ask myself, well, do you have metta jhana, Ajahn Achalo? Uh, no, I don't, by the way. Um, do you have a third jhana? Do you have fourth jhana? Pure equanimity, Ajahn Achalo? Have you established the Insight into path and fruit, are you an unshakable sotapanna, Arjuna Shalo? And what will happen? I have, I have, there have been a couple of occasions, I don't think it's, I don't think I have that much key laser in that area, at least not lately, in terms of puffing up and thinking I'm that wonderful. But there have been some occasions, and what I've noticed is, is you, you have to prick the inflation. And it's like, what usually happens is, oh, I don't have jhana. Um, I'm not a sotapanna. Mm, okay, I guess I'm not that special. And something actually happens, like a there is a kind of a... So at times it's appropriate to compare oneself. 
uh, what's my level of um, compassion like compared to the Dalai Lama? And how devoted am I in my selfless activities compared to the Dalai Lama? How much patience and renunciation do I have compared to Ajahn Sumedho? I don't know how well you know Ajahn Sumedho, but because I, I have personal chats with him, the amount of praise and blame that he has to practice with is extraordinary. And uh, you know, all the people who leave Amrawati because it isn't what they wanted it to be, and all of the monks and nuns that disrobe because it, you know, the conditions weren't supportive enough. If Ajahn Sumedho believed those kind of thoughts, he wouldn't still be here. You know, all the times that he felt, you know, if he was to feel, you know, I'm a very senior monk, I've developed some insight, people should be respectful to me, and if they're not, I'm leaving, he would have left in the first year. So it's like, you know, we do have among, among us people with quite remarkable qualities. So, you know, I can bring to mind, compared to Ajahn Sumedho's commitment, where am I at my level of commitment? compared to his patience, compared to his wisdom, compared to his consistency of mindfulness. So at those times when conceit is around, a little bit of holding a mirror to that is helpful. And then, But it, don't let it go too far, because if you start to lose confidence in your ability or energy for your practice, that's going too far. So it's good to remember, yeah, we have the potential to develop insight, maybe we've developed some insight already, have to keep going. Of course, real insight is going to po point at not-self. So, Ajahn Anand, my teacher in Thailand, is a fairly small man. He's short and he's very humble. So when it's time to speak Dhamma, he can be quite fierce. And when he's not speaking Dhamma, he can hide in an empty room. There's not a feeling of a big being there. So it's, uh, living with people like that is very helpful. And I've seen him in public situations when he's out of his monastery and he just drops the moment he leaves all of the roles. And you might see him walking through an airport and it's like you would not think that this monk was anything special at all by his body language or uh, energetic projections. It's just emptiness and not grasping. So living with people like that is a very nice mirror if one has the possibility. Ajahn Liam, who Ajahn Chah chose as his abbot after he uh, was going to pass away in Thailand, is an extraordinarily humble and modest man, and uh, in, uh, amazingly so. And yet he does his duty every day. Every single day he gives a reflection to his monks after the meal, every day without fail, about uh, how to develop insight, how to practice with monastic conventions. And uh, he does his duty immaculately, and he has not the slightest uh, sense of self-importance. <laughs> he has a huge monastery. It's a monk that Ajahn Chah chose to pick up his, uh, his uh, you know, role after he died. And he didn't want it particularly either. But that's probably why Ajahn Chah chose him. <laughs> and, um, yeah. There's the sutta where the Buddha talks about the nine types of conceit. Are you aware of that one? It's an interesting one to contemplate, if I hope I can remember it correctly. If on occasion where you have a, a skill which is more developed than someone else, and you think that you're more developed than someone else, that's conceit. If you think that you're equal to that person, even though you're more developed in that area, that's conceit. If you think you're less developed than that person, even though you're more developed, that's conceit. If you're equal to a person in a certain quality and you think you're better, that's conceit. If you're equal and you think you're equal, that's conceit. If you're equal but you think you're less than that person, it's conceit. If you um, are less developed in a certain quality than somebody but you think you're superior, that's conceit. If you're less developed and you think you're equal, that's conceit. And if you're less developed and you think you're less developed, it's conceit. So that, that's an interesting thing to get an idea for what conceit is. It's the whole conceiving of self and other and all of the things we do about that. But I think the kind of conceit you're talking about is that when we think that we're really good and special, that uh, I've been doing this for a certain amount of time. So it's, there's ways to investigate that. Just coming back to body feeling, or investigating the body. What's so special about my body? Is it excrement? You know, it's like you can really kind of, is it the um, fat? Is it the aging skin? 
you know, so, you know we can. There's various ways that we can cha- we can apply insight practice to challenging that sense of self which thinks it's special. But in terms of the conceit, uh, many people suffer is that not feeling good enough and um, not feeling worthy and having aversion aimed at the self. Curiously enough, I mean, Dharma practice is always aiming, being aimed at the middle way and bringing things into a balance. And so in that situation, very important to aim loving kindness at a conventional self. So you see when there's times to apply uh, insight and then there's times to allow there to be a conventional self and be really, really kind to it. And then once you can get that self to a kind of a healthy well-being, you can develop inside again. But it's just just wanted to mention that as well because a lot of people have ill will internalized. And a lot of people need to do work there. So to do that, you need to be kind to the conventional self. Heal that and, and learn to not do that. So... I hope some of that was helpful. <laughs> so. So, yeah. Any questions, comments? I've been talking for a while now. You mentioned looking at in constant and positive, but I think it's quite difficult to come from our dukkha and suffering. So my teacher, my, my teacher Ajahn Nam would say, if you're going to identify with, well Ajahn Sumedha says it as well, if you are going to identify with anything, identify with that. In the initial stages. Identify with those moments of peacefulness and emptiness where there isn't much of a sense of self. Okay, that's the real me. It's like, just as an exercise, <laughs> at a certain point one will have to kind of investigate that attachment and that, uh, that assumption as well. But basically as a, as a training trying not to identify with dukkha, trying to identify with the potential of the mind. So most of us, even on bad days, if we really apply ourselves to meditating and really stick with the meditation object, after half an hour there is more spaciousness, more clarity in the mind. So it's like, okay, this is uh, my potential. This is pointing to my potential. The other stuff is karma and delusion. But it's right in there, isn't it? The Four Noble Truths, they're linked. Because there is greed, hatred and delusion, there is the path leading away from it. Because there is a state of not liberation, there is liberation. There's a link there. The Buddha didn't just teach Dukkha. And uh, that's why they're Noble Truths. It's a sense of relief, there is a sense of joy. And um, the, you know, I'm trying to say for the conductor to the is quite a big jump. It's a bit it's just kind of middle. So what this is where I think Samatha Samatha plays a very important role in this process. The well being that can come from Samatha practices. And many Westerners, because of our intellects, skip over it. And also dana. So many of us are generous from a dutiful kind of uh, place. Okay, I should be generous. The Buddha said I should. Um, when you see Southeast Asians come to the temple with their offerings, I mean, they're really blissing out. So it's not 
like I have to be generous because of dukkha. It's like they really have faith in the value of generosity. So just as a practice, it's like you, you, it's okay to have faith that generosity and sila is going to result in nibbana and mental cultivation. And it's, it's fine to feel really positive about that. Just as valid as completely identifying with one's negative habits. <laughs> Probably more skillful. And so you can see, okay, be generous and then rejoice in being generous. That's called chaganusati, which is one of the anusatis, which is a samatha practice. Consciously be generous and then recollect, I was generous and feel good and happy about it. It's not... There's still probably some dukkha there if you if people want to look at it. Subtle, but subtle dukkha. Because there's still, you know, a self and it's conditioned. But, you know, the Buddha's recommending being generous and the Buddha's recommending recollecting one's generous acts as being skillful. So there's that. Then there's the other samatha practices, metta bhavana, you know. Um, there is dukkha, yeah. But you can suffuse your own mind, your own heart, your own body with loving kindness. Once you've done that, you can radiate it outwards. Once we can do that, there's much less dukkha in experience, isn't there? It's like, really apply some energy to generating the heart of loving kindness, and dukkha is already much less, because it's a divine abiding, uh, a mind state like a heaven, heavenly beings. So there are things, a lot of things that we can do to make our dukkha more manageable on this path of um, working towards going beyond dukkha. And, uh, faith. If, if one does really believe the Buddha and was enlightened and since that time thousands of other beings have been enlightened, well, that's a very uplifting contemplation. And then if one believes that that's one's own ultimate potential, that's very uplifting as well. And I, rem I remember when I was a teenager kind of thinking that something was fundamentally wrong with the world and I remember being really worried about myself and I, felt, I remember thinking something was fundamentally wrong with me and I was really worried about myself because no one else seemed to be thinking that around me and I'm thinking, but it's really, no, something's really wrong <laughs> something not quite right about this picture and when I heard those teachings that, that essentially my mind is affected by greed, hatred and delusion and that's why I suffer I felt so relieved. I was like, oh yeah, that's what it is. And then, but then you hear that you have the potential to do something about this. I also just had it intuitively, I felt that that's true. Like I know that there's got to be more than this experience, this flawed, faulted, painful, frustrating experience. I just, there's an intuition which most of us have, we wouldn't be here otherwise, that there is something beyond this. And then to hear that teaching that the fundamental characteristic of conditioned experience is, uh, is unsatisfactoriness, oh, that was such a relief. Because that's what I knew. I thought, yeah, it really is. Nothing, <laughs> nothing to that point, when I was 20, when I did my first retreat, had been completely satisfactory. I was very, very frustrated about that. And I was completely unconvinced that anything I could see was going to lead to satisfaction was very, very uh, frustrating. Um, yeah, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Thank goodness uh, I met these teachings that uh, there is a path which leads to less and less suffering and then ultimately no suffering. That was a, a real relief. But there is a lot of joy along the path if one knows how to practice correctly. So this is where the samatha and vipassana, the insight, balanced with uplifting, calming, brightening contemplations is, uh, and the, the generosity thing, this is enormously important, very, very helpful. If we, if we really understand that generosity is going to help us have more joyful mind states, it's going to, good karma ripens as pleasant feelings. If you can take that on as a view, very, very helpful because you know, whatever good thing you can do, you can know that there's going to be more and more pleasure in my life as a being in samsara until I go beyond samsara. You know, that's, that's optimistic at least. And uh, there's always something we can do. We can always give something. And that, that's going to have good fruit. So, um, that's what helps me to see that bridge between dukkha and then eventually liberation as a, as a path path there.
cultivating good, avoiding harm. Anyway, talking for a while. Hope that some of what I said tonight is of some benefit to some of you.